What's going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and aren't subscribed, make sure and click the subscribe button, like, comment, and let us know what you think about the episode. If there's a particular guest or topic that you'd like to have on the podcast, we're always checking your comments on there and love to be able to take your suggestions and then get them onto future episodes. Today, I'm going to be chatting with Gavin, and he works at Firepunk Diesel, and he's also a huge first-gen fan, and his personal truck has just set a record. I wanted to chat with him about it. Also, ask some questions about setting up a first gen for more power, reliability, how much power they can make, and some differences between the intercooled versus non-intercooled trucks. So it's going to be a great conversation. Before we get to it, though, I want to remind you guys that our friends over at Kershaw Knives have a 20% off site-wide code for you. If you use code 23diesel20 at kershaw.kaiusa.com, it's a great way to save some money, get some really cool gear. So if you're in the market for a knife or hunting, fishing, EDC, something around the job site, it's a great way to be able to save some money, get some really cool gear, whether you need it for you know EDC or at home, at work. So definitely make sure to head on over to their website, check them out, and use that discount code to save some money. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Gavin and learning more about his first-gen VE truck. Gavin, welcome to the Diesel Podcast. Looking forward to chatting with you. I appreciate it. Uh, a little ways back when you messaged us and said, hey, I'm shooting for this goal on my VE truck. And as soon as I get there, I, I'd love to come onto the podcast and you did it. So I look forward to chatting with you today, learning more about yourself, the truck and the, uh, the process of building it. So welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Well, tell me a bit about yourself, what you do, um, you know, your background, and then we'll get into the, the truck details. Yeah, yeah, you bet. So I am one of the techs here at Firepunk Diesel in Plain City, Ohio. So basically what I do, I, I work on diesels all day uh, for Levon up here and in, in the middle of nowhere, but we, ha- we have a very good time doing it. Um, I My background is diesel in general, really. I, I went to four, year, four years to college for it and never really looked back. Was growing up, I've always went to truck and tractor pulls and that kind of, it kind of got me gravitated towards performance side of things. And through college, it was all heavy duty diesel stuff and got the got the opportunity from Levon to uh, come up here and play with some fairly cool stuff and took him up on the offer and I've been having a blast ever since. And I think of a place to send a Cummins to get either like a transmission or a full on build. There's a handful of places that I think about and Firepunk's one of them. What's it like working at one of the top places in the US to have a five nine or a six seven or you know, just a race truck built. Yep. I mean, it's it's very cool. Um I wouldn't say I don't know, now that I've been here, it's like it's just everyday everyday life, but I still see people's eyes light up whenever they walk in the shop and see some of this cool stuff we work on. And I definitely don't take it for granted because it's a it's a one in a thousand kind of deal. You just don't see trucks like we build very often. And the ones that you do, it's always even that whenever I see them that somebody else built one, I I always get all happy and and get excited to see them and i i can understand where customers are coming from whenever they walk into the shop get to see some really high horsepower stuff yeah for sure and you know when i think of i think of five nines a lot of the either trucks that will get um like shown or messaged about or the things that i see they're common rail few VP trucks, some 12 valve stuff, but you got a VE pump. And I really wanted to hone in on VE. Like where, tell, tell me where you're like, how you got the truck, why you gravitated towards that one, where it all came from. Well, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I get hazed every <laughs> single day. Um, I love common rail stuff. I love working on common rail stuff. I like, I like, I like, I'm a first in guy to sum it up. So what gravitated me towards the truck is I used to have, and a, a white and gray two-tone truck that I loved. I've always just been a first-gen guy. And the blue truck that you guys see today is actually the first-gen that I grew up in and that made me love first-gens the way I do now. It was our farm truck for the since like 2010. Uh, just so happened to come up that my uncle said, hey, I'm, I'm selling old blue. I'm going to get a fit-gen. We'll put a bail bed on it instead of using this as the hay truck. And said, so, do we have any interest in buying it? And I was there in 15 minutes with, with cash in hand ready to buy it. That that truck has a very soft spot in my heart, and I am diehard VE guy for sure. Um, I don't follow to the to the P pump swap stuff that everybody talks about. Uh, I know that there's more to be had with a VE, and and the drivability of them is just something that's always drew me to it, and the and the mileage and just the ease of working on them has always been very cool to me. The truck itself, when you got it, 
tell me about like what kind of condition it was in, what kind of plans, like, did you have a plan to take it this far when you first got it? Or did you just want the truck something to daily drive and have that connection with? I'm definitely going to catch a hard time for, for a lot of this. Um, the truck was, it's a 90, 92 W 250. Uh, it was pretty well, all original has 136,000 miles on it. Um, it's not in great shape. Like I said, it's been our farm truck for a long time and it's been used. Uh, but the original plan was keep the intercool factory intercooled engine in it. Um, do some slight upgrades, do a, do a slight turbo upgrade, which I did. I ended up putting HX 35 on it, which is a very, very small minuscule deal and a five by 12 injector. And I swapped it to a 47 RE transmission. And I, the plan was just to, just to simply maintain it, clean it up a little bit and use this truck to tow my shorty because I have an 89 regular cab short bed first gen that was, that I call my race truck. But the race truck's engine is now in the blue truck, as some of you guys have seen videos on Facebook, and it's developed into this big snowball effect that I get a very hard time about. When did that snowball start? When did it go from the mild turbo injector upgrade to it's my race truck? So, um, as most of you guys know, I have a dyno at my disposal here at Firepunk. Um, I'd slowly, every single thing I did, I would dyno the truck just to, so I knew exactly what did what and I could give as best advice as I could. So it came to the day where it had, I threw the injectors in it and the truck did 347 horsepower, um, just tune pump, a little bit of timing, five by 12s and HX 35. And it was a fun driver. I really enjoyed it. While I was on the dyno, Levon's like, well, you've already sprayed it once. Let's spray it and see what we can make on a little bit of nitrous. And we just ran a dash six hose to the intake to, and I was sitting in the passenger seat with a nitrous bottle and a ball valve. And it ended up blowing the head gasket, but the line was going straight vertical and it stopped at 575 horsepower at 2,100 RPM whenever it popped the head gasket. And you guys look back at some of my YouTube videos, there's a thumbnail that has a big fireball under the hood while it was on the dyno. And it, it blew, it literally blew the gasket out the sides of the block. You could see it hanging out. And right then and there, I, uh, for some reason, I decided to pull the engine out of the running shorty. It was my race truck and put it in the blue truck because I wanted to get some sort of data on it fairly quick. The shorty needs back half to four length. And I knew the blue truck could be racing this season. And it would tell me if it was going to be worth it to stick with the VE platform that I had swore by for the past five years, if it was going to be worth it or not. So I swapped the race truck engine into the blue truck and that's where it all started. What kind of setup do you have? <clears throat> did you have on the race motor? It was in the shorty so, that you swapped to the blue truck. Yeah. So it's, it is very simple. Um, it is a 89 short block, um, with the 155 degree bolt pistons in it. So I was, I stuck with the non intercooled bottom end. Um, it's got factory rods with ARP 14 mil main studs and ARP rod bolts. So not that that's going to help me shortening rods when I do spray it. Uh, it has the stage one Hamilton head from back in the day that had the big valve option. Um, it has a, and it's it's o-ringed but nothing crazy there in a 178 208 hamilton cam so very mild but uh, that cam really thrives in that zero to four thousand rpm range and that's where a be lives so that's kind of i was focusing on making the power early in the rpms as best as i could most efficiently that i could um the top end is your standard stuff just all the hamilton stuff as far as valve springs push rods you name it um but as far as injectors and, and turbo setup and pump, everybody's always asked me what's the pump setup because they can't believe what it's done. It is a 12 millimeter V pump from Evan Ratcliffe at Rat Ratman Performance. He is a guru with these things and he does a great job with them. It's got a set of 5x16 infinite performance injectors. And Weston is absolutely the man whenever it comes to this stuff. Um, I've, I'm really bad about wanting control of everything because I think I know these engines so well and what it needs to be set up as that I finally just handed the reins off to him and said, this is what I want to do. Send me what you think works. And he came through no problem. And the air setup is a bit odd. So it's got a S362 on the manifold, which is very standard for first gens. It's a 6268 with a non-gated 80 housing. It's got a 45 millimeter turbo smart wastegate on the on the manifold, just a regular steed speed T3 gated manifold. 
and it's got a 98 millimeter GT 55 out front. So it's a 98 113 with a 115 tile V band style exhaust housing on it. So you got some so air, then, you got like some I air said, going. <laughs> yeah. It's got a lot of air. Um, the idea is to thump as much, much air possible in a lower RPM range as we can. Um, and trans wise, it, it didn't get the shorties trans cause it's a two wheel drive, but it's just your, it's one of our, I think it's equivalent to a comp one. It's just a 47 RE controlled by an anteater, anteater pro pretty standard stuff, just a billet input and a billet output stock intermediate with a DPC triple 1800 stall converter. And it seems to be working. All right. And you'd mentioned when we chatted before about wanting to set a record with it, what was the record before and what did you do recently with it? So four years ago, the 12 millimeter VE record was on fuel only was 489 horsepower. Um, the 14 millimeter record was set back in 2005 ish by Brian block. And it was 630 on fuel, but the overall record was held by Mr. Jason Sands of diesel diesel world magazine back at that time. Um, he had made 972 horsepower on nitrous, I believe. And that is, that was the overall record. Um, of course I would love to have, have it all, but what we did this weekend actually last Monday, technically was the fuel record and backed it up a little bit this weekend. What did it, what did it hit when you put it on the dyno? So on the dyno, the previous Monday, um, just for testing before our dyno event, it did 729 horsepower back to back times. And then we put where we hooked up the nitrous, um, it's controlled. I've got a maximizer five on it. Um, the single one thirty six and the mega jet and, a 99 jet it did 1200.2 horsepower on the dot on Monday. Uh, come around to the dyno day. I made some mistakes um, that I learned from, but with a lot more nitrous than what it took to make 1200, it did 1178 and ended up winning the event with that. Uh, with the amount of nitrous that was in it, LeVon said with the correct amount of fuel to go with it, it was about a 1500 horsepower tune up. So it, it should have done more, but I, uh, for some reason, the KSB was not active past the first run. I left a dash four cap open on the back of the intake because I hooked up CO2 to control the wastegate and forgot to hook it back, close the boost pressure. And I ran what most pullers do in their fuel. And it is a basically puts, puts oxygen in the fuel, but it made my EGT so cold it was putting out the fire. So as soon as the nitrous would come on, it went to about 720 degrees EGT. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> I mean, those are really impressive numbers. And you think of how long the e trucks first gens have been modified. <clears throat> People have been making yeah. power with them. To be able to do that on fuel and then on nitrous, and you're you're not done yet. I imagine. I, I, I nope. imagine you're going to keep going. No, we we fully believe there's still more in them. Um, I've got a full AEM CD5 data logging system on the truck that which has helped me progress as far as I have really. Um, but according to I'm monitoring things within the case or in the, in the case of the pump, um, according to it, the pump is not running out. It's not draining the pump. So we, we have talked to Weston a little bit with about injector stuff and, and Evan a little bit about pump stuff and kind of got on the same, on the same page there after the event. And we've got some ideas for the following weeks to do some testing and see what else it's got left in it. What's your ultimate goal for a power number? Uh, my ultimate goal, I've always, I've always said that 700 was doable and I've never thought 800 would be on fuel, uh, especially with a 12 mil. Nobody really, people would laugh at me for saying 700 was, and we did it within, I started this on, I finished it the night before UCC. So er, early June and by July 13th, it had done 728. So I was pretty thrilled with that, but I really would like to crack 800 on fuel. That would be a very big deal. Right now, the truck runs the 770 index with ODSS very, very easily. In fact, I have to pull fuel out of it to be able to run it. But my goal, my goal would be to make 800 on fuel. As it sits right now, I think 1350 is doable on nitrous based off what we saw Saturday. So I think we'll see. I don't know what my end goal is as far as power, but I really would love to run uh, the 670 index with it. I just, I'm, I've got to get myself to put a roll bar in it. I just, 
I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> Especially since I have a race truck. Yeah. Maybe swap it back over to the race truck. <laughs> yeah. The now what's so interesting to me about it, like I said, is because when I think of Cummins performance, it's it, it really is the common rail. <clears throat> the O three to 07s, and then I know it's just a, that's what's really captured people. Absolutely. And when I chat with first gen owners, a lot of times they're they're passionate about it because they have a connection like you did, where it was something they grew up with or their dad or grandfather had and they love it. And then they just want to maintain it or they're looking for efficiency. Yeah. So fuel economy, things like that. And then every now and then a guy will reach out to me and he's like, I don't want a P pump. I don't want a common rail. I don't want a six, seven Cummins. I like the first gen, whether it's some connection, the body style, whatever it is. And they'll always say, how do I make more power with it? So say, maybe not to the level you're at, but if they want to hit that 400 horse at 450, maybe 500, what would you tell somebody with a first gen truck of some ways that they can do it with air fuel? Um, we could probably skip the transmission part for now, which I do want yeah. to get to in a little bit, but just the, the engine part of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I do want to be clear this truck, like it's, it is 100% clean on the street. It averages around 17 miles a gallon. So it's it's very drivable just because it's still a VE pump. But with that 400 horsepower range, that is that is very doable on a stock max pump. Um, the Obviously, some some know the intercooled pumps are, are capable of around 420. If you get a really good one, those 205 pumps can do mid 400s with just being maxed out with, a, with your choice of governor spring. Obviously, that's not going to affect power output. And then your choice of fuel pin and and obviously timing is going to come into play, but really a quality five by 14 injector and a, I'm, I'm a whole set guy, even though my truck currently doesn't have a whole set on it. I do. I'm a big fan of the stock appearing stuff as it has great manners. So really a 62 or 63 millimeter uh, stock appearing HX 35 would get you to that 400 horsepower mark. No problem. And still have great manners. Um, even the 450 mark, like Evan, Evan did on on Saturday. That's a very reasonably built truck, purpose built as well, and it's his daily driver. It's a has a 67, 67 uh, HX35 on it, and a six, set of six by 13 injectors, and it does have one of his comp pumps, and it did 496 and on 35s. So if he would have put our dyno tires on it, it it would have cleared that 500 mark. So. You don't need something wild like I have in order to achieve that goal. The biggest key is pump. Um, I would, if it was me right away, I would spend the money on a competition style pump because they don't sacrifice any sort of drivability or any sort, any sort of anything. It is you bolt it up and you would never know the difference besides all of a sudden you have a lot more power. The The biggest thing with the comp pumps like Evan sells is you cannot run a stock injector with them. Um, it'll, the pump will eat itself. So at minimum, you need a five by 12 injector, which on a stock max pump is capable of right about 350 horsepower. So even then, uh, it's worth the investment. In my opinion, uh, a comp pump with a five by 12 will do a lot more power than a stock max pump with five by 12. So keep that in mind. It's very comparable to CP3 or common rail stuff. I mean, obviously like a a set of 60% is going to be more capable with a 12 mil than it is a 10 mil or anything like that. So that's just a big thing to keep in mind. Uh, focus on air. That's a that's a big thing to be as efficient as possible. But 400 horsepower is very attainable with a VE truck. You do not need to put a 160 P pump on your first gen like everybody does just to go make 450 horsepower. Um, there's a lot more options. You can save your money and, and spend it in other places by sticking with the VE platform. Do you, do we need to do head studs and valve train upgrades when we shoot for that four to 500 mark? there but uh uh yes head studs valve train stuff uh it can be crucial especially the head studs the even and i i mess with some stuff around here whenever people want the stuff just a stock truck with a max pump they'll they'll bring it over and the last three non-intercooled trucks that i have tuned pumps on um Basically, they they live right up until I give them a little bit of timing, um, not a very big timing bump at all, about four ish degrees of timing. And the last three have all popped head gaskets with stock head bolts. So it, it adds a, the cylinder pressure is there for it to happen, even just on a stock truck with pump tuned. 
So I would highly recommend getting yourself into a set of ARP head studs or, or whatever your choice is. My truck, obviously with the amount of nitrous I'm running, I, I run 625s. I, I would like to keep the head down on that thing. But yes, head studs. And once you're past a 3200 governor spring uh, and you get up to that 38 or 4200 spring, you need to invest in some valve springs, which are very cheap for 12 valve stuff, which is nice. They're very reasonably priced. Push rods you can leave alone for a good while. That's more just a peace of mind kind of thing. But yeah, very good question. You had mentioned not going the P-pump route to save money. So in like this this type of build, where would you put that money that you saved? What would you invest in for something you're going to drive on the street, maybe take to the track every now and then, you're going to have some fun with. Where would you put that extra money that you saved? Yeah, yeah, no. So if if I was saving my money by it not doing that swap because it is time intensive and it does it does cost money like everything else in this community, but I would take the money from that invest and invest in some sort of transmission swap because that is fair, a fairly costly thing with first gens. Luckily, working where I'm at, I'm able to piece some stuff together for for less than normal. But uh, transmission is the biggest thing in those trucks, and once you take care of that. It becomes a whole new driver in itself. Just the drivability in general is much better. And it's it's just more enjoyable to say the least. Um, but if it wasn't there, I would say something to do with the steering and everything else from a 30-year-old truck that was subpar design back in the day. That's where I would invest it. And with the transmission side, the way I understand it is the 89 to 93s have a non lockup, like a 518 or 618. So you would be talking about going to like a 47RH, 47RE, depending if you want hydraulic or electronically controlled. How difficult is the swap? What are some things that you need to account for, either with the transfer case or just other components to be able to swap a four speed with lockup in it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the two wheel driver, two wheel drives are honestly easier. Um, you can obviously, you don't have to deal with the transfer case or front drive shaft, but the biggest thing, on those, you can take the factory cross member and just slide it back a little bit and redrill new holes in the bottom of the frame. And you can use your factory cross member with those. That's on the 47 RHs and a two wheel drive swap, which is very attractive to a lot of first gen owners. Um, as far as four wheel drive set up like mine has, mine's equipped with the 47 RE. Um, so it doesn't have that really long overdrive housing on it like the RH stuff does. So with mine, um, you're looking at swapping an adapter plate in from a 47. You're looking at upgrading starter, well, upgrading swapping starters to either a second gen starter or mine has a third gen starter on it. Um, the only difference is the hookup for the solenoid. It's either a, an eyelet or just a clip. Um, and then you're looking at drive shafts is, is a big part of it. And then some stick with the NP205 transfer case. Mine happens to be a NP241D out of a I believe it's an 88 to 92 W150. So that would be a, a, a half ton four wheel drive pickup, similar to what Mr. Logan Yelton has on his race truck. So they are stout units. They're just a, a passenger side drop, which is one thing you have to look for with these. It's much, much less rotating mass than that heavy MP205. So those are the big parts of it. And then your way to control the transmission, whether you're with an RH and you're sticking with that, uh, the hydraulically shifted unit or going to an RE. And the only difference as to why I went with RE is because uh, we offer off obviously an anteater to control the transmission. And at the track, I can make quick adjustments with mile, what mile an hour I want it to shift that and really dial it in versus if on an RH, if you want something changed, you're more than likely pulling a valve body and changing some things as far as shift points go. So that's kind of why I went the route that I did with that. But yeah, big things, adapter plate, starter. You have to build a cross member for the four wheel drives. And then you've got drive shafts, which are basically your big key points there. I did want to ask you about the anteater because I don't know a whole lot about it, but I think the REs give you so much ease of control and changes that you can make. Can you walk me through just like the basic operation of it? Like, what if I do want to change certain things with it? How do I do that? How, how does the, how does the product work? So really, as far as uh, the product goes, you receive your anteater, you will download the anteater software um, with through on the paperwork that it says, it gives you the link to follow. 
Um, you download that software and you can, it uses a USB cord that you plug into your laptop and you get a base file with a base file of three tunes on it. And they progress progressively get to a higher or a sooner shift, I should say. So the second tune that's on there, it will shift. It, it will make the shifts sooner than the first one. The first one is held out longer. So those will give you a base baseline tune on how to set up your shift points. It has options in there for your tire size, your gear ratio, your governor pressure modifier, all of that good stuff. And then it has basically a large graph with a plot below it that has a whole bunch of numbers for each gear, whether it's the one, two, the two, three, as well as all the downshifts and when you want to block up to come in that puts in different colors on a graph. So it's easily, you can look at it, you can watch your live changes, which is very neat. And basically you, you build it based off of that. Uh, we do set up a lot of base files for people. Um, Landon here at Firepunk Landon Miller is a, anteater guru he sets up tons and tons of anteater tunes for people just to get them off on the right foot and the race racing application stuff which will be a flat line tune because it will be based off of 100 percent throttle obviously and it's pretty pretty easy to use honestly um people tend to not go ahead and ask the question because they're worried about calling and asking the question but we <laughs> very much think you should because we are more than happy to walk you through whatever you need and um, it's it's fairly user friendly, and the guys over at Firepunk Engineering are actively changing things. So now, um, in a newer version of what they're going to release, they they have a way to basically data log. They have a certain amount of time that that'll show you the log of basically you could pull a a, a data log from the transmission controller, which is kind of a new thing. Um, and you can you can pull the log that you previously had from the anteater to your computer versus having to look it up and everything and not remembering which, which file you have in it, which were, that was just kind of hitting some complaints that were there before, like, man, it'd be really cool if you guys could do this. And they managed to find a way to do it. So that is coming down the pipeline here pretty, pretty soon. It's really cool how it has some preloaded files in there. And then also the ability to, you know, call in or get some help if somebody's building a truck like this or even a different one and they're using a 47 or 40, 48 RE. I thought of another question from the beginning because I don't know this, but I, I imagine you're the guy I should ask. What is the difference or what are the differences on a non-intercooled versus intercooled, the engine itself, um, different components that people, if they don't have this truck, but they're thinking, hey, I found this non-intercooled one, but there's also an intercooled truck. Should I go with one or the other? I gotcha. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And some of the purists will get on me here. I, I have had both. So I, I know all the differences, whether I think of them all off the top of my head, I don't know, <laughs> but the intercooled, the non-intercooled trucks, they're a little stouter in stock form. They run they're You can make those pretty hot, pretty easy to be honest with you. So the non-intercooled trucks are going to have a 155 big bowl, what we like to call them piston in it, uh, which is the superior piston. In my opinion, that's what I put in my truck. So versus the 145s on the intercooled. Um, another difference as far as engine goes is obviously with different bowl sides or come with a different factory injector. I believe it's a four hole versus a nine hole. Um, four hole being the non-intercooled. The non-intercooled engine comes with a 50, 50 millimeter compressor, 60 millimeter turbine, and I believe an 18 or 21 cm turbine housing. Um, so a very little guy. It is a very, very small turbocharger on those things. Um, the pumps, uh, the KSB on the pump is different. It is a wax motor style uh, KSB on the pump on the non-intercooled trucks. Let's see what else? Um, they don't come with some of the 90, 92 to ninety three intercooled first gens come with provisions for for attack on those trucks. So it's a plug and play kind of deal versus the older trucks do not. Yeah, obviously the non-intercooled speaks for itself. There's there is no intercooler there. The radiators are a little bit smaller on the non-intercooled trucks. Um, a lot of the two, I think all two-wheel drive trucks come with 307s, but the non-intercooled trucks were very notorious for it because they only had a three-speed with no overdrive for 89 to 91. So that was a that was a key thing. Um, but as far as engine-wise goes, I don't think there's a whole lot more there. Um, like I said, the pumps are a little bit better non-intercooled in the factory form, but intercooled stuff, you, you get more options. 
Um, like my, my truck is an LE, so it, it has power mirrors. It has power windows. It's got cruise control. It's got all that stuff. There is some non-intercooled stuff that did come with that option. One of my buddies has an 89 that had a lot of really cool options on it that has different style setup, but it does have all those features as well. So as far as interior goes, I do like the intercooled stuff better. That 91 and a half to 93 has got some cool stuff and some really cool color schemes as well. But that's that's difference wise. That's what you're looking at. I, I can't think of many more off the top of my head. What would you say would be some either common mistakes that you made or that other people that that have first gens make when they're approaching making more power? So maybe say we're going a little bit farther than that four to five hundred horse mark and they're thinking about a build. What were some mistakes maybe you made or common things you hear about that can help people avoid making them themselves? And some big common mistakes I see often, whether in even myself, um, like I said earlier, a key thing is the transmission. That was a big thing when I had my old truck. I had the fuel, I had the air, um, cause I had some good injectors and some, a nice set of compounds. And I still had an A518 that I really wanted to believe in because there were some people that said that uh, if they were stout enough, they would, they would work if you built them properly and spent some money on one and still just didn't put out like I thought it it should so that's a big thing uh, that i see a lot of new people make as far as decisions go they they don't invest the money in the transmission and they spend all this money on a pump injectors turbo and it's just blowing all the power out through the whether it's the clutch or the torque converter uh, they're making sub 300 horsepower versus you could spend the money on a transmission and tune the pump and out of a out of a stock non-intercooled truck as far as stock injectors and stock turbo goes you can get to 280 300 horsepower right there no problem versus um not having a good transmission and only being able to put down low 200 horsepower because that's really all about those transmissions were worth power wise now whenever people start getting trying to make more power than that a uh, big big issue i see is turbo selection um, some people would probably group me into that category but it's a lot of people are uninformed on how compounds work in the first gen world. Um, a lot, I see a lot of people just go slap a, seems like a notorious one is an S366 SXE. And they have, they get the biggest one they can get. So it's a 66, 74 with a 9.1 T4 turbine housing on it. And on a common rail, that turbo drives terrible, let alone on a, on a very RPM limited VE pump. So I would say turbo choice is a key, key factor. Um, Definitely go conservative. You can make your power early and you'll make more power by doing that than trying to stretch it out in the RPM with a stock pump. Um, I also, at that time, did not have a comp pump. I just thought a stock max pump would get me where I wanted to. I thought that was going to be the ticket for 500 horsepower. And unless you have a one-off deal, it is not. I have seen, you know, now that I say it, I don't think I've ever seen a stock max pump cross that 500 horsepower barrier. Um, David Live say sitting at 489 was the closest I've ever seen one. And he has a triple turbo set up that, I mean, it's a very awesome truck. Very awesome. But uh, a competition style pump is definitely something I'd invest in. So uh, the guys that build those, there's three guys out there that I know of. My personal favorite, obviously, is Mr. Evan Ratcliffe. Um, Eric Gilbert at the Hungry Diesel, he builds a competition style pump as well, which he was out here competing at our event all the way from Idaho. So He's a big supporter of the VE stuff. And then there's a gentleman named Verlin Martin that also builds them. And he had a 14 mil pump here at the competition this last weekend. So those are three guys to look out for. Uh, choose them as you'd like. I am biased to Evan because Evan is a very good guy and I have a lot of data, a lot of late night phone calls on the dyno with Evan kind of figuring stuff out. And um, Definitely a guy that's willing to put in the work to achieve the numbers that we did this weekend. You had mentioned the the compound turbo setup being different in the first gen world. What makes it? Is it the RPM range that you have that makes the turbo selection different than a common rail? Yes. So even on um, a tow pig style um, first gen, so you got a stock max pump. Um, you want to have something that's quick spooling, and a lot of guys go for that, uh, like an HX thirty five or a K27 turbocharger, maybe an S362, and they'll they'll put over the top of that a 472, something that small S400 range is what they'll pull it up, put over the top of it. And that is a very good quick spooling setup that does great. 
Um, it's not going to make a ton of power for with a first gen. The as far as head flow and stuff goes on these trucks, it's just not very good, especially non intercooled stuff. Um, with mine, we pretty well kind of put to rest the whole thing about uh, pairing your turbos on compounds as far as the spacing between millimeters, you could say. Um, I've got a 62 millimeter on the manifold and a 98 millimeter out front. And what you want to use that Atmo charger for is really to, as LeVon likes to say, to thump the air in at that same RPM range. You want to be able to thump as much air in it as possible and as dense as possible. So with what I did is we, we achieved that. Um, basically went up to the biggest size charger I could without losing any drivability, which obviously with that S300 on the manifold, it's fairly small. You are able to maintain all of the drivability. I don't lose spool time. The truck is still on the charger by 1900 RPM. It's really not a problem at all. Um, but that's a big misconception about first gens and compounds is it needs to be super tight where yes, your manifold charger does need to be small. But if you have a good size atmospheric charger and a way to control drive pressure, that can be very deadly, as we have proven. Um, like Mr. Eric Gilbert, he has a similar idea there. He has a 364 and a half on the manifold and a 480 out front, which granted it's not as big on the atmosphere, but it's still the same idea in, in the first gen world. That's a very big tur turbo setup for a BE pump to most people. Yeah, this first gen stuff is it's crazy that when I think of the performance side of, of the diesel community, a lot of times it's focused on the newest and the latest and the greatest. But what has always been so cool to me is the older trucks and the power they can make in the aftermarket support, people like yourself, um, some of the companies that you mentioned that are still supporting them, building products, still redefining what we think the limits are of yep. these trucks. And I think that's a lot of the allure of, of picking up an older one. They're simpler. The parts are less. Um, they're easier to work on. There's a whole bunch of things you don't have to deal with on something that's older. And plus it has that, that classic styling to it. Are those things that remind us of our childhood or it's just some sort of story that we really like, like the Ford OBS guys I've had on, they all talk about that too. They gravitate towards that truck because they grew up on it or knew about it. And it's cool to see the power levels, um, that are getting there. And I'm sure there's a whole bunch of components and different things that people can choose or questions that they have. If somebody wants to reach out to you, um, you'd mentioned YouTube um, and some other ways, how can people get in contact with you, learn about your truck, maybe ask about their build, ask about the anteater, how to set up a transmission. What's the best way? Yeah, absolutely. So my YouTube, um, it's just Gavin Huke, uh, H-U-K-E. That's just, just my name. Um, I've got videos from the past five, six years probably on there over first-gen stuff that is very usable stuff. Uh, and then obviously my Facebook is the same. Just look me up. Um, and then my Instagram is forged the number one and then Jen. So basically forged one Jen on, on Instagram, um, reach out to me either way. I am more than happy to help the guys. I, I hate whenever they've already got a truck set up and it's already too late. We need to change everything from what they've done because they've gotten bad advice or not real world experience. And I am more than happy to help. Um, it's it's always exciting to help somebody out with one of these trucks because they're not super common around me. And whenever I see one come to the shop, I always get all excited. Uh, so those are those are good ways to contact me, and please feel free to do so. Um, I'm I'm more than happy to help anybody. Maybe bring some more guys at Firepunk over to the dark side of the VE world, and <laughs> oh, that's going to be tough. I catch a lot of a lot of crap for that. I will, well, it's still I a Cummins, right? Stuff, but yeah, I get the I always. Before it made what it did now, it's, oh, I could have a, my, my tuned common rail could make that power. And I always get so mad, but <laughs> it was, it's all in good fun. What, what's cool about it though, is I mean, they're right. A, a stock common rail can do it, but there's so many of them out there. It's, it's, you don't see first gens well ever like the power you made, but you don't see them make those power numbers. So it, it adds another element of cool to it that definitely caught our attention, catches a lot of people's attention. So. I'm sure I'm sure we'll be able to bring some more people over, but I appreciate you reaching out and, and your time explaining uh, some of these things. It's arguably the the one generation I know the least about. I don't have any direct experience with them, but they are that. It's like the first truck in my mind. I know there were other diesels before it that were on the market, but to me that was the one that kind of ushered in. The, these are more mainstream, um, the aftermarket side of it, and then it just kind of carried on through each generation. 
from yep. there. So it's cool to go back to the beginning of it. It yeah, was no, uh, absolutely. I agree. I love them for what they are. It didn't matter. Doesn't matter if this truck makes 700 horsepower on fuel or if it makes 300. I have a smile ear to ear driving it down the road. I I love them. Don't forget, diesel fans. Make sure and head on over to Kershaw.kaiusa.com. Use code 23 Diesel 20 for 20 percent off site wide. It's a great way to save some money, get some really cool gear. So if you're in the market for a knife for hunting, fishing, EDC around the job site, they've definitely got you covered. They've had a huge year in 2023 with a bunch of new releases. One of the newest are the Duralock models, which the blade's made out of D2 steel. The way that the blade opens and closes is really smooth, positive um, in the hand, and there's different choices for blade shape and also handle design as well. So definitely make sure head on to their website, check them out, and use code 23diesel20 for 20% off site-wide. I also want to give a shout-out to some of our Patreon supporters, Tyler Lowen of 23diesel, J. Cole John, all of our other Patreon supporters, all of you who subscribe on YouTube and podcast apps, follow us on social media. We appreciate all your support here in your seven of the diesel podcast and look forward to bringing you more of the content that you guys want to hear in 2023 until next time. Keep the shiny side up.